Carlisle Group. Until earlier this year, Larry was CEO of CSRA uh, when it was purchased by General Dynamics. Larry also held senior positions at CSC, SAIC, and BAE Systems. Uh, Larry served as a Marine Corps Intelligence Officer. That'd be CORE. CORE, thank you. And a professional staffer on the House Intelligence Committee. And has degrees from Loyola, Marymount, and Georgetown Universities. Larry, always good to see you. Thank you for coming. Well, let's talk about priorities first. Uh, tomorrow is the 243rd birthday of the United States Marine Corps. And uh, to my fellow Marines, uh, friends, uh, happy birthday, Marine. Um, this last year, I was uh, said the CEO of CSRA, and uh, we sold the GDIT in, in April. Uh, the company was spun out of CSC. Uh, we merged with SRA. Uh, we did an IPO. Uh, acquired NES and Praxis before the sale. It's quite a mouthful in a, a busy two years. Uh, throughout this process, uh, Enterprise IT was center stage, uh, both for the markets that we served and the company we created. I think it provides an interesting case study I want to present to you today in about eight minutes. Uh, during the process, I learned to listen well uh, to my CIO, John Dancy. Thank you, John. Uh, and my Chief Technical Officer, Yogesh Khanna. Uh, any good idea or thought that I share with you today is theirs. Uh, if you think something I said is stupid or offends you, I will own it. Uh, we began by creating an IT environment from scratch. Uh, I came in with a bias uh, to move everything to the Amazon Cloud, uh, but also committed to our deep bench of technology partners uh, across the stack. Uh, we recognized that cyber defense needed to be our first thought in designing our architecture and working with our partners. Uh, we also understood how important the transport layer and network fabric would be in this choice to move to the cloud, uh, both for the initial move, but also for ongoing operations. Uh, in the initial move, we found uh, some workloads were not moving gracefully. Uh, John and his team switched to moving data with what I called big damn hard drives. And we've now seen the market make good use of Amazon Snowball and uh, uh, the, the <laughs> Snowmobile. That was the one that really impressed me. Uh, but it also made us think about longer term ongoing operations where distance and time might matter and affect the quality of the work. We recognize that certain workloads would not be moved for a variety of reasons. And we learned a lot along the way. Uh, the reality was we created a hybrid IT multi-cloud environment with about 50% of our work ultimately residing in Amazon, about 75% in total in the cloud, and the rest in our own data centers uh, with thoughts towards an on-premise hyper-converged stack. Um, hybrid is both private uh, plus public, often with the same vendor, and it often will include multi-vendors. Um, government customers will operate hybrid environments, uh, both on-premise and off-premise, and with a mix of legacy and next-gen technologies, and they're going to be doing this for years to come. They'll do it for good business reasons, and they'll do it to protect uh, the sanctity of the mission. Uh, each government enterprise has literally thousands of apps, uh, many of which need to be retired, uh, many of them should be replaced, uh, and most of them should be moved to the cloud. Uh, enterprise also has uh, sources of data, uh, both those essential to their applications, as well as a lot of data spilling on the floor and not yet mined for value, which is a great first place to accelerate cloud adoption. Uh, one of my peers at Amazon used to tell uh, uh, the story of if you're going to get started in uh, moving to the cloud, um, you really don't want to jump into the deep end of the pool. And what might be appropriate is thinking about all the data you spill, um, put that in the shallow end of the pool, and it has a gravitational force uh, when you have enough data, it attracts applications and it attracts people with use cases. Um, at CSRA, we mapped every VM and we moved significant work to AWS. Uh, but we also relied on the future promise and the investment in the cloud by Microsoft 365 Azure uh, for so much of our collaborative work alongside our CRM tool of choice, Salesforce. And it was great to see both partners double down on their commitment to our government customer. Within the company, we managed our personnel with Workday. Our teams created private cloud mission-focused stacks 
and this is for customers, and we used Red Hat OpenStack, OpenShift, or VMware. We also relied on SAP HANA and Oracle Financial DB for so many of our customers. So, so just think for a moment as you're moving work to the cloud, uh, where you got an app that's cutting six million transactions a night, uh, where if you miss one, it's going to be a long nightmare to you fix it. Um, it makes you double down on the resiliency of a private, dedicated offering. For example, using Oracle Exadata, running Oracle DB on-premise. And someday, yes, someday you might consider Exadata in a public, dedicated segment of an Oracle cloud, uh, but you're honestly going to think twice about it before deploying Amazon, even as you map and move every VM in your inventory. My point is, is that the work across the enterprise demands you broaden your architecture to allow these best-of-breed companies to help you improve performance and execute mission. There are a handful of these ecosystems now emerging. And yes, lately, it seems like they're at war. In this enterprise environment, you have to create an architecture where CIOs navigate the respective swim lanes of ecosystems led by AWS, Microsoft, Oracle, Red Hat, IBM, and Google for ease of integration, but all the while focused on keeping your users happy. These hybrid environments uh, and new delivery models are going to require enhanced capabilities, uh, really interesting solutions, a lot of talent, and management acumen to address higher complexity as we deal with both the realities of IT today and to technologies on our horizon. Um, cloud first is the de facto strategy. Um, cyber requires continuous focus, visibility, and integration into every facet of our operations. It's critical and must be in the DNA of everything we do and everything we build. Uh, the fusion of AI and the cyber domain uh, for faster detection of incidents and auto remediation at machine speed will be the norm. And our government cyber professionals will need the freedom to actively defend the network, protect their data, and gain advantage inside the control plane of any cloud instance, private or public. AI has the potential to automate every layer of the tech stack. Uh, we will save time and labor costs on a myriad of tasks, and we will apply AI to more challenging, predictive outcomes. Companies that I really admire are going deeper with AWS SageMaker, but many of them are not ignoring competing capabilities from Microsoft, Google, and IBM. In an enterprise, you have to look at multiple options in the reality of your organization. For example, with AI and machine learning, a Microsoft shop is likely to go with Workbench for Microsoft for de developing their machine learning algorithms, while the rest of the enterprise may be deeply engaged with SageMaker. Data is the new currency. Actually, my favorite Cloudera t-shirt is, data is the new bacon. We are seeing a full spectrum of capabilities being created to collect, store, manage, analyze, distribute, and apply data for better outcomes. There are several horizon technologies that must be on everyone's radar, and most of it which will drive breathtaking demands on our transport layer and our switching fabric. As we serve our customer at CSRA, we benefited from our strategic partnership with Cisco in thinking about how to scale and secure our future multi-cloud architectures as they optimize future growth in data and processing power. 5G is being tested now globally. It will increase bandwidth to end devices by orders of magnitude. Uh, the IoT space continues to mature. It will dramatically reduce the time gap between intelligent data and that data's impact and outcome. And with IPv6, data is named and worked at a granular, molecular, atomic level. This will have a transformational impact on what is extended to the edge and how we use end devices with truly spectacular compute capability. Back at the core of the enterprise, quantum computing brings unprecedented compute speeds that creates new opportunities and new threats. For example, allowing nation state actors to break codes on currently encrypted systems and applications. Uh, blockchain is creating a lot of buzz in government, and I'm beginning to see uh, the first signs of viable use cases that are emerging and can benefit all. We also need, though, to look beyond this horizon, uh, which leads me to one last thought. The U.S. is in danger of losing the innovation war to China, especially in artificial intelligence and machine learning. 
the investments by China in next generation technologies and how they are applied dwarf what we are doing here in the United States. It is centrally led by their government with a strategic long-term focus. We're not doing enough in the United States. We need to support the Congress and the executive branch, especially the Defense Department, as they focus our nation's rich talent of these technical ecosystems that I talked about and all their current and future workforce to win this strategic competition. Thanks for your time.